Hi, I'm Voltam, founder of the Linux Distro Community. The Linux Distro Community is a place for people to hang out and discuss Linux, Linux distros, software, and open source. The Linux Distro Community is a community funded by its members for its members. We are a friendly, welcoming community that encourages people who use Linux operating systems and software to share their passion and knowledge with other people. We believe that when people share information freely, everyone benefits. Our community is also a great place for people who have been using Windows and have been thinking of making the switch to a Linux operating system, a place where they can benefit from the sharing of knowledge. Linux operating systems and software developers have given us all the ability to choose from hundreds of free Linux-based operating systems and thousands of free programs. The least we can do is freely share our knowledge and share with others our experience whilst using this software. If you are using Windows right now and have had enough of all the viruses, spyware, malware and are thinking, there must be a safer way to use the internet. Please consider using a free Linux operating system today. There are many to choose from. Ubuntu, Linux Mint, Pingai OS and Zorin OS are just some of the more popular easy to use operating systems. And for the person who wants more of a challenge from their Linux experience, there is also Arch Linux. Millions of people only use their PC for internet, social networking, voice and video chat and email. If they only knew that you can do all that on a Linux operating system safely and securely, that's where a community like ours comes in. Not only are we passionate about Linux operating systems and free software, we want other people to feel the freedom that we do when we use our computers. This is all part of a bigger picture, that as humans, we are rewarded by helping others. We were born to share and promote freedom. We'd love to see you become a part of the Linux distro community. You can voice chat with us on Mumble or text chat with us in IRC. Head over to linuxdistrocommunity.com for details. Join in today in the sharing of knowledge and the freedom that a Linux operating system gives people. Thank you. And thank you, Voltam, for that wonderful introduction. And today on The Zoo, we are talking about why Linux sucks. We are all users of Linux. We find it to be very useful in our everyday lives, but each of the guests on my panel has one thing that they do not like about Linux. But before we start with today's topics, I would like to hand the microphone over to Oscalet, who has an announcement for us. Hi everyone. Uh, I'd just like to announce that in the next uh, few weeks, hopefully, I will be initiating an e-learning class within the Linux Distro community. Um, this e-learning classroom will consist of education into the world of security and the term hacking. This, of course, will not be black hat hacking, which is stealing credit card information, getting Facebook passwords, that kind of nonsense. This will be proper education for proper knowledge of how networks, uh, how computers work, how they communicate, proper ICT, proper pen testing, professional stuff. So I'm just informing you guys so you can know when this is going on. I will hopefully get uh, on the next one. I will hopefully release a date for this. Uh, anyone who wants to join can just email me. I'll give my email address in the next show and we can kick it off and hopefully some people will be interested and they can learn proper networking, learn how to hack efficiently and professionally. Now Oscalit also hosts the Linux Zoo crew on his servers. Thank you so much for that. And also he has started up an RSS feed. Please tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I just had a couple of people uh, asking about it. I actually had ideas beforehand, but a lot of people were asking because uh, they have likes of Banshee and Rhythmbox and all these media players. And they have a nifty little feature where if you input an RSS feed, it'll download files automatically. So if you have a podcast you really listen to, if you listen to... Linux uh, Zoo Crew, you can have it automatically download. So every time a new one comes out, you'll have it automatically there, which is fabulous. All right, wonderful, and thank you for that contribution. Uh, I know a lot of people are going to like that, and I also have an announcement that I'm going to make as well. As many of you know, I am shifting my shows focused over to multimedia. So when I'm uploading this episode of the Zoo Crew, I'm actually going to be having a video that will accompany this, and I'm going to show you guys step-by-step 
how I put these shows together so that if you decide in the future you want to do your own podcasts, you will be able to do this yourselves. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. It's why Linux sucks. And uh, first, I'm going to uh, introduce everybody on my panel, and then we'll get to the first topic. We have C. Smith. We have Edward, OptiChip, Oscalit, Pingcasts, Rob Graves, and Techman. Welcome, one and all. And we'll start with you, C. Smith. Uh, the thing you mentioned that you didn't like about Linux is the command line, probably one of the most powerful features in Linux. Please tell us about that. Yeah, I found the command line to be extremely hard to use for new users of Linux, and if they could at least simplify that a bit, it would make it much more powerful, in my opinion. So, you can see where I'm going with this, correct? Oh, yeah, I felt it was a little daunting at first, but it didn't take me long to assimilate this. Uh, Edward, how do you see that? Uh, the issue with the command line interface is like when you was back in Windows, basically, when you had to learn what commands... As, uh, all you need to learn is what the commands are called, how to use them. Each command, te um, theoretically, has a hyphen hyphen help, listing all the possible commands that go with the command. Um, as long as you know what the commands do and how to put, how to input the commands, you will find um, like untaring and wget quite a lot easier once you learn about these things. And that's why we've got the likes of Google and ourselves. Oscar, what do you? What is your take on the command line? Just exactly what uh, Edward just said. There is a lot of help with the command line for new users. It may seem very very daunting. However, if you take a little bit of your time and go out there on the internet, ask your friends that use Linux or Unix, because most of Linux commands are Unix commands, go out and learn them. And there's not that many you need to learn. As an, uh, as an average user, you only really need to know about six, perhaps. You need to know how to use your package manager. You need to know how to CD into directories. You know how to edit a file. Really simple stuff that to be honest, isn't that difficult. For the new user, if they just go out and take a little bit of time, it'll not be that difficult. Of course, if you just jump into a command line without knowing what you're doing, you'll be running around like a headless chicken. So just take the time and learn it, and you'll be fine. Up to you, I think that um, when, when Linux started out in 92, you know, it was a command line interface, and back in 92, it was DOS. People were used to the command line interface. Today, Kids and uh, newer users of computers are not used to the command line interface. They don't understand what's going on there. They've never had to use any of the types of commands in DOS, which those DOS users found it fairly easy to convert to Linux. So those commands were not really hard for those people, and they're not hard for older older Linux users to, to use. Rob Graves. Oh, uh, yeah. Actually, this is something that um, I feel is one of Linux's strengths. Um, it is hard to learn at first, and uh, I mean, it can be especially hard for someone coming from the Windows world to learn how to do this stuff. But uh, I find that the Linux command line is actually extremely versatile, and there is a lot of amazing, amazing things you can do with it. And I'm in awe of what some other people do with it that put my, my commands to shame. But certain uh, tools and functions being piped through other functions and... Uh, appending files and whatnot, I find it actually to be, I, and it does get complicated, and it can, it's capable of being complicated, but it's something that I find that I want to learn more of, and that I would like to uh, be able to wield that power more. You know, I, uh, you know, I actually made mine uh, visually pleasing. I actually pimped mine out and did some really neat things with my bash prompts and everything because you know what i spend a lot of time in the terminal i've gotten comfortable with it but yes it was daunting in the beginning but um with a little bit of time and patience i was able to pick it up google is your friend duck duck go even better if you're worried about them tracking you pincast what's your take on the command line okay <laughs> my bash um well well it's these days, people are very, very used to their point-and-click interface, and they're very comfortable with it. They're probably coming from a world where it is a last resort only, never a first resort, or some resort here and there. They're very used to only using the GUI. So it's very difficult to convince somebody to open up a, a an application like a Terminator and type in their commands instead of using their mouse. 
and it it takes some getting used to, but it it's Bash is pretty powerful. It's amazing what you can do with it, and if you are willing to learn it, uh, you can you c it can change your computing experience on Linux because it opens up a lot of doors for you. So I don't know if people should be forced to use the command prompt, but it certainly is a powerful tool that I would recommend that you learned how to use. It can really help you out. Alright, and last but not least on this topic, Tech Man. What's your take on the command line? I personally um, am still kind of a new user to Linux. Um, I have found the command line to be very useful. I enjoy uh, being able to hide files inside of other files. I find that quite interesting. I do know how to change directory, and I can move and delete and add files and make directories like that. So I find the command line to be very useful um, at any point in time. I'm just going to say that I am not exactly against the command line. It really is... A great tool, it just, like I said, it's daunting to learn at first, as you've said, Spatry. Alright, now, Edward has a really good reason why he dislikes Linux, and that's the fact that it comes out every six months. More and more distributions need to have rolling releases. Tell us about that, Edward. Yeah, basically, if it's a rolling release, you just keep updating your system, there's no need to download an ISO, there's no need to do the system upgrade on Ubuntu. And you're always up to date. It's like that's the reason why Arch is so bleeding edges because it's pretty much rolling release. And they shouldn't have to wait six months because, like, three months down the line, you get the betas and the alphas and the RCs and all that sort of stuff. And basically, they should just listen to what what's popular on the like on Distro Watch. If you look at the top hits per day, you see an Arch getting right near the top. And I don't think people are realising why it's becoming so popular. It's because people want to customise it and be able to have it as a rolling release. Now, interestingly enough, for those of you Linux Mint lovers out there, after you've had a chance to get comfortable with it, you can install the uh, LMDE, that's the Linux Mint Debian Edition, and that is a rolling release distribution. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I do think that one uh, taps off of testing. So um, you can at least have a nice little rolling release there, or at least it's semi-rolling. All right, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll go back through the rotation again. C. Smith, how do you see it on this topic? More distros having rolling releases. I feel that it could be the lower currently. Very much so could be said about Ubuntu, which has some fallbacks due to that. Uh, they're great um, if you like living on the edge, um, but I do understand where Ubuntu is coming from. They've got to support a product for five years, so um, they're not going to be on the bleeding edge. They're going to make sure that they release software that does work for their users. So that's why Ubuntu is kind of behind the times, but rolling releases in general are great for people who like to live on the bleeding edge, and if there's new hardware that you're going to be using, rolling releases is where you're going to be. Oscar Lee. Yeah, just as everyone else has said, rolling release is pretty awesome. I couldn't live without it, but that's because I'm a serious geek and I know what I'm doing. Uh, if you don't know what you're doing, it's not for you, because there'll be problems out here, there, and everywhere. Uh, at least with Ubuntu, you know it's tested. <laughs> <laughs> if Total OS was here, uh, you know it's tested, and you know it's going to work. Whereas just rolling releases, it's just like, as soon as an update comes, it may get like a short test, but it doesn't get tested extensively. So there's going to be errors, there's going to be stuff. That's brilliant for me, because I like fixing the errors. But for the beginner, not so great. So basically, if you're a beginner, you just don't want that. You want a nice, stable distro. Ubuntu, Linux Mint, any of those. If you are a hardcore geek that programs, you know how to fix the errors, you're not afraid of that. Arch Linux, Scan 2, all that nonsense. And casts. Oh, well, rolling releases are great, but there can be complications. As Oscar said, you're going to want to be a bit more knowledgeable. And there can be breakages that you might have to fix that requires knowledge, that requires learning. And some people just don't want to learn about their machine. They just want to uh, pick it up, do something a couple of clicks, be done with it. They might only use it uh, for uh, browsing the web or word processing. So that could, uh, they just might not be interested in learning all this stuff. So it's good to have that standard release so that you don't have to worry about bleeding edge, stuff breaking, uh, editing config files. That's not for absolutely everyone. It's not for everyone at all. 
So it's good to have those distros out there, and Ubuntu has the LTS if you don't want to reinstall every six months, so you don't have to do it frequently, so that's good too. So rolling release, not for everyone, but it is a pretty good thing. Rob Graves. Well, I recently have been running uh, Arch for the last three or four months, so that is a rolling release, and uh, it keeps me on my toes. <laughs> so... Uh, I mean, I have to make sure that upgrades don't break things and that I read up on what upgrades are going to do from the Arch uh, news and uh, forums and the wiki and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, uh, I kind of like how the other distros that have specific releases like Ubuntu or Fedora or so on and so forth, they have a flag in the ground and it says right here, look, this is what we're doing. And they've got the fanfare of here's our new release. All right, and, of course, OptiChip went on to say that, of course, distros like Ubuntu have missed out with the latest and greatest Intel chip, which is now released. So rolling release would have to be where the users would get the most from their new processor. Now, I'm running Arch myself, not ArchBang, the full Arch, and, yes, I have to agree with everything that was said. Sometimes an update can cause some minor breakage, but then again, I always read the documentation. I just don't blindly download updates in the system without reading the documentation first because usually on a rolling release when you check out a website check out their website their wikis that sort of thing they're going to let you know of any potential problems that an update could cause and ways to prevent that from happening so as long as you are conscientious about what you're doing with a rolling release you can expect to have a wonderful user experiment experience okay now OptiChip has a topic that he's bringing to the table. Graphics drivers, total OS today. You should be here for this one. Go ahead and start us off, OptiChip. Graphics drivers are the bane of anybody who runs a rolling release, uh, especially the ATI AMD drivers, um, also the NVIDIA. They just don't keep up with the developers of the OS. There are so many more OS developers than there are graphics driver developers, and they're proprietary, so they don't let anybody else work on them. Everybody else has to come up with their own code, and if you want to use the proprietary drivers, which is going to give you the best performance for your graphics card, you're going to end up having to wait until the graphics manufacturers release an updated driver that will actually work with what you're using. C. Smith. I cannot say I have any experience with proprietary drivers because I use an Intel chip, which is, I'm going to be frank, it's not good for gaming. The one thing I have noticed is that the Intel chips seem to have pretty good graphics support right out of the box. While I will admit they don't have the best in terms of graphics acceleration and that sort of thing, um, they never really did in Windows either. Um, as far as that goes, I mean, yeah, they have some acceleration, but I mean, they're not all that great. Edward, your turn. Um, I've had issues with ATI drivers and NVIDIA drivers. Um, I was currently running a, um, an ATI, I think it was 5500, and, um, I enabled graphics drivers and light total OS today. I had the screen tearing issues, so I didn't bother with that. Uh, and then I got a GTX 570, and if I booted into Linux normally from a fresh install, I'd have, I've got two monitors, I'd have the same image on both monitors, which is fair enough, but then you get flickering. Um, it won't let me take my resolution up to 12, 1280 by 800 or whatever. Um, so I had to do a no mode set and then I had to go through the installing proprietary drivers. So Linux is, is quite far behind when it comes to, to proprietary drivers. Oscar Lit. Uh, don't really have much uh, troubles with graphics drivers because I don't really use graphics on my computer. So yeah, a bit of a hardcore terminal type person. Pinkcasts. Same thing with Oscar. I use the terminal a lot. I haven't really uh, gotten into the whole driver uh, mess. I haven't tried proprietary drivers or doing this and that to get the most out of it. I haven't bothered much with graphics. Rob Graves. Now with uh, Ubuntu, I have had no issues whatsoever. I always run the proprietary drivers, and they just work for me on Ubuntu out of the box. But Arch has been a completely different story. Normally, nine times out of ten, when I break something on Linux, it's going to be something related to the proprietary drivers, and I break X. So... 
and it's been fun learning how to uh, fix that. <laughs> Tech man. I have only had um, one time where I had to use a proprietary driver, and even at that point, I never did get to use it. I was on a live boot of Zorn OS uh, looking and repartitioning a hard drive for one of my friends. His Windows had died. So I was having to go in and fix it for him. Um, my thing is, is the wireless card did not come default. It did not come default with a driver. It had proprietary, but I had no access to Ethernet, so I have downloaded the proprietary wireless driver anyhow. Okay, now here's my take on it. All right, now every Linux distribution I have had installed on my computer, I had to download and ins uh, I, I tried downloading and installing the FGLRX drivers. And they were absolutely wretched on every system I have used. I've actually found the default Zorg drivers work just fine. Even better in Arch by just simply following step by step through the Arch wiki, writing in my configuration files, making sure that I have the correct driver downloaded and installed. I've found that the default XORG drivers are magnificent. And you know what? They keep getting better. And as the XORG drivers mature, newer cards will eventually have support. I know that the, uh, that the um, HD 6000s don't have full support yet, but they're working on it. You know, unfortunately, it is what it is. These OEMs just do not uh, want to, you know, give the information to uh, the community so that they can properly write the drivers. And I think this is something that the OEMs really should consider doing. Hey, this is how this chipset is made. And because I'll tell you what, the community is absolutely brilliant when it comes to creating uh, drivers and driver sets. It's just that it takes a while. The next topic here, Oscolit has that the developers are simplifying things too much and taking the power away from the end user. Tell us about it. Yep, it's a very, very big problem. Uh, I remember the days of Linux. I'm not that old. I'm only 18 years old. And I can remember the days when I was given a really, really old computer and I was given a, a piece of software. My, my mother told me, make it work. <laughs> and I didn't have all these simplified things. People think Linux is really hard. Uh, go back to the days when you had nothing. Didn't even have the internet because my mother was, we didn't have it. We just didn't. It's so, I don't know how to describe it. I just wish things were back the way they were and people realize that it is so simple for them these days. Instead of complaining about how hard it is, just go and learn about it and learn how hard it was for us people back in the day. Okay, now, before I pass the mic on, I'll give you an example of what he's talking about here. For example, we have uh, we had GNOME 2, and now we've got GNOME 3, and then, obviously, GNOME 2 was loved because it was highly customizable. You could right-click on your uh, panel, and you could add all these little widgets to it, and you could uh, move it around, position it however you liked. You could make it look like a little uh, launcher panel if you wanted to. I mean, it just gave you full control over customizing your system, that sort of thing. See? Smith, you're next. Yes, I honestly cannot say much for the old way, but I do say from what I'm hearing that Linux is much, much easier on the, on the magnitude of thousands of times easier. Edward. Yeah, like back in the day, probably like when we was like nearly born, Spatchy was probably in your mid-twenties or so, um, everything was done from this command line and then, the, then they created... Um, graphical user interfaces and then everyone got used to that and they just drifted away from doing everything that's behind the scenes and basically people need to learn and it's not as hard as it seems yeah i remember the earlier distributions where uh gnome one and kde one were out and i was playing around with them and uh, i i just loved how easy they were to customize i just never stayed with them because of driver support of course ping casts I have to ask, is the user willing to learn? If they're not willing to learn, they're probably going to look for dumbed-down software. If they're willing to learn, they're going to want to get something that they're able to uh, customize and take advantage of. Rob Graves. Uh, I don't really mind if they make a GUI front-end for, uh, like, a command-line uh, tool. I just, uh, I usually find that the command-line tool has more that you can do with it, and ultimately that's what the GUI tool is doing. And at some point, you end up learning that anyhow. But they lower the bar uh, with the GUI tools to, 
I think really just to get new users, more people coming in from Windows, the Windows world, because everything there has a GUI front end. Tech man. I can completely agree with what was just said. I came from Windows, and everything there has a GUI to it. Um, in my later use of Windows, I did start learning how to use the command prompt. And I'm like, this is pretty powerful. But in Windows, of course, it's very limited as to what it can do. When I switched to Linux, I saw that a couple of the commands were the same. And I went and I've learned quite a few of the Linux-specific commands. And I must say that I like the command line. And the GUI is useful. And at the same time, if the user wants to learn, they can just pop open the terminal whenever they want. All right, Pinkcast um, wanted to mention that he dis the one thing he dislikes about Linux, why Linux sucks, is because there's lack of standardization and users can end up being a little bit cocky. Go ahead and tell us about that. Well, to elaborate on the cockiness, it's just the bad attitude. Some people just have a terrible attitude, they're rude to others, that obviously is problematic. Then you have the standardization. Um, so many file formats, .rpm, .deb, .tgz, uh, what was arch, .pkg, .tar, .xz, I think it was. So, if you want to, you got to package it for the right distro. Something that works on one distro might not work on another, and that, because it's using the wrong file format, you have to know how to package for this file format, and this file format, and this file format, and this file format. So, you can wind up jumping through all these hoops just that you shouldn't have to just to get something to work. Uh, we have OSS, ALSA, Pulse Audio, uh, Jack. We have multiple different uh, sound architecture, loads and loads of distributions, uh, lots of different applications that might do uh, a specific tax, task, like loads of video editors, loads of movie players, if uh, some people may be united and kind of work together a little more, we could even see better applications because there's more people collaborating and working on something. And they're just, it would be so much better if we were a bit more uh, united in our efforts. Edward. Um, yeah, like we said on previous shows, it's all about what the user wants and what the user's used to. Some people might think that it needs to be run one way, some people think they prefer it run another way, and it's just that's why there's so many variations because no one can agree. Oscillate. Yeah, exactly. Options are good. Uh, one thing could be bad, whereas the next thing could be good. So the developer of one program may not want you to continue development of it. So therefore, you have to start it all over again. Simples. Rob Graves. Uh, I kind of see this as a double-edged sword. Um, in one case, it would be very nice to have uh, standardization, whereas, every, like Pincast was saying, uh, everybody could be working together and collaborating on a project and... Um, would be using the same format across the board and uh, the whole community working together in unity. But at the other and uh, the other side of this is also that uh, I think everybody's you can go your own route, and if something doesn't work uh, with one thing, you can just cast it aside and move on and try try the other format or what have you. Tech man, um, I agree with that. I believe that there should, in some cases, be unity because uh, more developers on an application, there's more ideas, and then the actual application itself could just be better. There might be less of uh, like less applications to, to do the same thing, but the one or two applications you would get would be better than the five or six that would not uh, be as good. C. Smith. Yes, I just wanted to add that if we take all these options away, what do we have? A free Libre open source software version of Windows. <laughs> Cute. All right, Rob Graves. He thinks Linux sucks because of lack of games. Tell us about it. Uh, I consider myself a hardcore gamer, and the only reason that I really keep Windows lying around right now is because of my games. I uh, I like to play like Battlefield Three, uh, Civilization Five, um, X Three, Terran Conflict, so on and so forth. I could list a bunch of them, but uh, X Three is awesome. Yeah, yeah, um, and. This is getting better. I've actually seen uh, Linux games in the past and how they've matured a lot. Like currently, like uh, Minecraft, you can play in uh, Linux. Uh, I've been playing the Xenotic game actually uh, recently, and I think that's actually a lot of fun. Um, but 
Uh, and I haven't, to be honest, played with wine much. I haven't really ventured into that, and I need to, considering that I'm a gamer. And I'm not really sure yet as to what works and what you have to do to make it work. I've looked at their uh, database online and stuff, but uh, it would really be nice to have native support. I don't foresee that happening anywhere near in the future to have games released with native Linux support, but um, it's an ideal, I guess, to strive for. Interestingly enough, Wine does play a number of games, not all of them, and there are tips, tricks, and techniques for getting them running. I've had good success with some and no success at all with others. So dual booting is a good option. Uh, but also, there are so many great free and open source games out there, and uh, I have a number of those games listed on my channel, and there are a number of them I have yet to review. So definitely check out your software repositories. There are a number of good games. A lot of them are ranked. If you're using the Ubuntu Software Center, you'll see how people have stirred these different games and stuff. And you know, a lot of these free and open source games do provide a great deal of challenge. Some of them are just downright difficult to play. And um, so, you know, uh, there are some other options there. C. Smith, what's your take on gaming? Well, I've seen, I've seen many examples of great games, but I can say, as you were saying, some of them are difficult. You probably haven't tried Chromium BSU yet, then. That is impossible. Edward! I've only really gone for the um, first-person shooter games, like Quake 3 and um, Open, Open Arena. I have tried using Steam in Linux through Wine and just no avail, so I've just not wasted much time on it, really. I'll just stick to Windows for gaming. After you, Chip. I'm not really a gamer anymore. I've kind of retired from gaming. I think it's just because I'm getting too old and too slow for it. But um, definitely, you know, if you're going to stick with the gaming, do leave Windows on your machine for that one and only that or, reason. Yeah, that or get a Wii. Uh, Oscar Uh If you want to play games, uh, Linux isn't for you. That's just the end of it. Uh, that's due to several different issues, and it's not just because game, the makers don't make it on Linux, it's down to other issues and packaging and whatnot. But uh, I play a lot of open source games, and that's what I like playing. It depends what type of games you want to play on Linux. If you want to play a nice open source game like Minecraft, my favorite game, I can get that working better on Linux and I can't on Windows. So, you know, if you want to play the latest uh, blockbuster, if you want to play the latest Battlefield, Call of Duty, the latest Rockstar game, uh, Linux, so it, you may be able to get it working. I heard Diablo 3 was working under Wine, which is quite impressive, but uh, I'd say about seven times out of 10, it's just not gonna work. And there's nothing we can do about that at the moment. Pinkasts. I'm not much of a gamer anymore either. Uh, I just don't enjoy gaming like I used to. Uh, I, pl I play the occasional game of Warzone 2100 on Linux, but that's about it. Uh, if, if you're gonna game, yeah, you either use Windows or grab a console, because there's just not a whole lot on Linux. I mean, there's stuff like Chromium BSU, but that's not the same as uh, Call of Duty or Mass Effect or any of the other games that you might like playing. So either stick with Windows, do a console, do something like that, but Gaming is not like that on Windows, or I mean, it's part me on Linux. You know, interestingly enough, once I started getting into Blender, I completely removed my Windows 7 gaming partition, and now I'm just running Arch uh, on the full drive now, because, you know what? <laughs> I'm just getting such a thrill out of creating and designing some really good 3D models and characters and that sort of thing. So, you know, I've kind of, you know, decided to push the games aside. Eventually, I'll pick them back up and play them again, you know. But, um, you know, there are other uh, alternatives there. All right. And Tech Man, your turn. Um, I do not game at all. Um, and my only reason for keeping Windows around at all is just because I figure as soon as I let go of Windows, I'm going to want to use it. Because, like, on my old computer, when I switched from Windows to Linux when it crashed, I found myself missing one or two Windows features and just couldn't get them. And, and as, as soon as I delete Windows permanently, I'm going to need it to reinstall my operating system or something, to download something or other. All right. And the last topic we have here is a real annoyance. This drives me absolutely batty, and it's those notifications on the upper right-hand side of the screen. Tech Man, tell us about it. 
basically in Linux, what ends up happening is every time your computer is plugged into power, unplugged from power, connects to or disconnects from a wireless, and a host of other things, it pops up with this batty little notification in the top right hand corner above whatever program you might happen to be in saying, this has gone, this has done this, this has done this, and it's like it just won't disappear, and you're like, in Windows, it doesn't do this. It may drive you insane with the update notifications, but when you unplug and plug in your system, this little power icon appears beside your battery, and that's the end of it. If you disconnect or reconnect to your wireless, the, the icon changes, and that's it. C. Smith! Yes, I don't find notifications to be at all irritating. I find it actually to be helpful that I can actually look up and see what's going on when I'm not in the window. Edward! It's a good idea. Only issue is, why it's being mentioned on IRC, there's no interaction with them. You can't do anything. You can just hover, it appears it, you move it away, it dims it, and then eventually goes away. There should be options to be able to have, like, some op you know, some options in there, like if you've mounted a hard drive, you should be able to open file, like you can in KDE. That's the issue in Ubuntu, basically. It's a basically an Ubuntu-based issue. Yeah, maybe even change the timeouts on them as well. OptiChip. Are we talking about the, like, the square notifications or the little ones up at the top? I mean, there's ways to, you know, you can move those around your screen to where they can be in the upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right, to get them out of your way. Yeah, just as everyone was saying, if you notice me in IRC, I just posted a big, No, this is on Ubuntu, not Linux. You can remove these notifications if you want to. I actually don't mind them on Ubuntu because they kind of look nice. <laughs> I like the kind of sleek look they give. So, yeah, they're they're removable. If you don't like it, get rid of it. Just don't sit there complaining about it. Don't go, wah, wah. Get, get rid of it. It's not that hard. Yeah, I have them on Arch, and I just never took the time to figure out how to remove them yet. But I'll eventually will, and I'll do a uh, tutorial on how to get rid of them. Pincast, you're next. Uh, notifications are fine, but over notification can be a bit of a problem. Like, when I disconnect wireless, I don't need a pop-up telling me it. You just dis disconnected the wireless. No, really. I didn't realize that. I clicked wireless off. I didn't realize it was off. But uh, I'm on GNOME 3 at the moment, and I, you know, I just I switched them off. I have an extension that instead, it'll while it's off, it'll uh, my logout button it'll turn red. So I know there's something that needs attended to. But it's not going to pop up in front of my application and block what I'm doing. I just know that there's something that needs my attention, I can get to it when I get to it. Rob Graves. Um, since I've been running Arch, I haven't seen these at all. Uh, I'm going to have to side with C. Smith, though, with when I am running Ubuntu or whatever. Um, I do find them helpful, actually, when they pop up. They don't last long, and they don't get in my way anyway. Um, and that's really all I gotta say about that. Yeah, and it's not often when they pop up for me either, but the thing is, I just don't like the fact that, you know, when you hover over them, you can't really close them. Um, but I'll figure that one out uh, when I cross that bridge. Like I said, I don't get those, uh, I don't get those that often, but if I'm in the middle of something important, I really don't want those appearing on the screen. Okay, and then mine was uh, the, the thing I hate about Linux and why Linux sucks, there's just so many haters out there, okay? The Ubuntu people, the, you know, people that use Ubuntu hate us Arch users. As a matter of fact, I have a troll uh, that, I, that, that was attacking my channel uh, at one time because I switched to Arch. And, uh, well, I may have lost a few subscribers. I also picked up 2,000 more, so, I mean, at the time, so. But there are some haters out there, you know, um, especially if you, like, go on an IRC uh, and you go into the uh, Arch Linux room and you tell them that you're using ArchBang, you know, uh, they're really going to give you a hard time about that. So uh, I wish there were a little bit less of that going on. C. Smith, how do you see that? Yeah, I see that as kind of against the free software philosophy right there is that you shouldn't be adverse to each other you should be giving whatever you can to the whole community and that is exactly what the linux distro community here is all about everybody is welcome it doesn't matter what operating system you're using if you're using windows if you're using OS X, you are still welcome to join us here we are not operating system agnostic we are all one happy family and we're always willing to help edward your turn yeah, basically, like you said, it's each to their own, really. I mean, there's not just one distro of Linux, there's like thousands. That's why it's so popular, is because there's so many choices that people can make. And yeah, we're not going to hit on you just because you're a Windows user, unless you're tossed today. <coughs> but anyway. 
Opti chip. Uh, you know, I've got to say something about those channels in IRC that people go in and ask for help in. Those people have been in those channels for way too long, and they need to get out and do something else with their with their time. <laughs> I'd have to agree with you there, Oscalit. Yeah, just as everyone else has said, whatever distro you use, that's fine by me. Uh, I may do the occasional pun, and I may say, oh god, I hate that distro. But it doesn't mean I don't want to help you. That's the whole point of open source and Linux, the fact that you have the choice. I may not like it, but it doesn't mean I'm not allowed to help you. Just because I don't like it, uh, it doesn't mean I have this whole big red hand, uh, no, go away, talk to, th you're, not, you're not getting in here. I still want to help you because I like doing that. Uh, I know specifically what IRC channel you're talking about, and as everyone on Freenode knows, the Arch uh, channel is the troll is the troll channel. There's just thousands upon thousands of people in there talking absolute BS. Pink casts. Yeah, it's not just Arch Linux. I've seen other channels doing this, and that while you may not like it, somebody else does. Just because it doesn't work for you doesn't mean it won't work for somebody else. It might work for them and just because it works for you doesn't mean it works for somebody else and you have to acknowledge that not everybody wants to build their own distro up from ground up. Not everybody wants to uh, be on the bleeding edge. Not everybody wants that. Some people do. Not everybody. Some people want easy. Some people want a, a, a bit harder and really just hardcore config the system. It's all about choice, so we need to stop. You shouldn't just jump at somebody's throat because uh, they said they like this distro and they chose this. You need to be accepting of that choice because it's about freedom. Rob Graves. Um, I uh, think there's some level of like elitism and kind of like an arrogance in some regards to some of these distros. Not to say that everyone that's using these are like this, but some people will say that... Uh, a distro that maybe require more, they're going to look down on someone that's where there's uh, an easier distro to work with, a more beginner friendly one. And like, I've got my sister running Ubuntu and she loves it and it's perfect for her and she should not touch Arch at all. But uh, she absolutely loves Ubuntu and that's what works for her. So like in everybody's case, whatever works best for you. Um, that's tech man. Um, I completely agree. I'm trying to switch my friends to uh, Mint or and or Ubuntu because I like those distros. I cannot use Arch. I'd like to, but I cannot, so I do not. But in my opinion, it's the technical people. Like, for the example, that Arch room, they're so technical that when you come in and say that, oh, I'm using Arch Bang, they're like, you really aren't doing what this channel is meant to do, so get it. We don't want to talk to you. They should help you because Arch and Arch are basically the same thing. Interestingly enough, when I was running Pinguy OS, which of course is an Ubuntu-based distribution, I found a lot of answers in the Arch Wiki, you know, for problems that I was trying to solve where I couldn't find an answer in the Ubuntu forums. And, you know, there are a lot of solutions that are out there that doesn't necessarily uh, have to be uh, specific to your particular operating system, you can find possible solutions and workarounds. I mean, we're all running Linux in one form or another. and uh, uh, But that's why we have the Linux distro community here. We're always willing to help. Yes, every now and then we will crack a joke. Ah, uh, he's using Windows, somebody kick him. That sort of thing. But you know what? <laughs> it is what it is. But we all say that in jest. We are all here to help you out when you have... Uh, when you have problems and that sort of thing, if we if we can, um, I know I don't know all of the answers, but if I don't know the answer, I'll at least try and point you in the right direction. Well, gang, we have run out of time, and uh, with that being said, I'd like to thank C. Smith, Edward, OptiChip, Oscalit, Pinkcast, Rob Graves, Techman. Thank you, all of you, for uh, those wonderful topics. This is, these are the things that we found that we didn't like about Linux. These things can change, and we may possibly see some change in the near future. I'd also like to take this time to thank everybody for participating on IRC who is in our listening room. As always, it's good to have you. And I'd like to thank everybody who is watching this podcast on YouTube. Thank you for all of your comments uh, that you're putting in the space below. 
Um, now we have the RSS feeds, and I will make sure that uh, I put that link in the show notes, as well as links to all of these participants here. You will have links to their shows. Please check them out. They are all well worth your time. We will be back again next Saturday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, UTC minus 5. Please see the time zone converter so that you can be sure to be here. Come early uh, because seats for the show do fill up quickly. Thank you, all of you, and we will see you next week. Today's show was brought to you by the Linux Destroy Community. Visit us today at linuxdestroycommunity.com and chat with us on Mumble or in IRC on the Freenode Network in the Linux Destroy Community channel. The Linux Destroy Community, freedom through the sharing of knowledge.